Let's give God praise for our young people and our music ministry today. Let's give God some praise. We we went different direction today, dear. Let's give God, let's give somebody say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come today to say thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you gave us a heart and a mind to come out this day, lay everything aside, and come to this place and lift up praise unto your name. We thank you, Lord, for the voice that sang. We thank you, Lord, for the children that lifted up their voices giving praise to you. And we thank you, Lord, for that you allowed us to give you praise today on the stringed instruments and the organs. And for that, we say thank you. God, we pray that you move us now into an even deeper place, Lord, that we may have open hearts and open minds, that we may hear a word from you. Empty the preacher out right now, God. Fill him up, Holy Spirit, that your word would take life in this place and that we will leave out of here knowing not only that you are good, but knowing that you are our God. Let it be so right now in the name of Jesus. Let the people of God say, thank you, Lord. Or let the people of God say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you know God is good, give God some strong praise here. Amen. I'm, I'm glad. I'm thankful to God today for so many of you who didn't take the fifth Sunday off. Somebody say amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm so glad that you didn't take the day off. Amen. Amen. If you got your Bibles, join me in the book of First Kings. First Kings. We're going to near about to wrap up our, our section, our sojourn in regards to Powerful prayer. Amen. In the book of 1 Kings, say amen when you get there. While we're doing that, I want to take a moment to acknowledge a good friend of mine, a friend of this city. Uh, Coach Rambo, just wave your hand over there. This is Everybody give God praise for this man, Coach Rambo. If you're, I'm going to tell you why you're giving God praise for a bit a minute. Coach Rambo has worked with youth. I'm going to go back as far as I can remember in the 70s, but he probably was in the 60s too. But he definitely worked in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and still continues to work with the youth of our city. And anybody that committed, I just think we ought to just say thank you, Lord, for that person. Let's give God a praise for Coach, Coach Rambo. Just a good, I looked out, I didn't have my glasses on. I said, like, Coach Rambo, I'm so glad to have him here today. I'm glad to have you here, Coach. Glad to have you. Worked so diligently. I didn't realize that, Coach. I'm sorry about that. Ram Coach Rambo. Amen. Amen. Let's give God praise for Reverend Dr. Coach Rambo. Come on up here and sit with us. Come on up here. You want to hear. All right, I'm going to let you say about that today. Next time I see you, I'm pulling you up. Amen. Amen. In the book of 1 Kings, chapter 18, we're going to read a few verses, but remember, you got to keep your word open today. Amen. Amen. 1 Kings, chapter 18. I got a little vibration up here. You got it? First Kings chapter 18. We're going to begin reading in verse 36. Give you a few pages turning. I'll wait till you get there. Chapter 18, verse 36. First Kings. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Read that again. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou hast turned their heart back again. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, there were transforming prayers then, and there can be 
transforming prayers now. It's up to you. Amen. Amen. Over the last few weeks, and those of you who have been here, we have looked and seen and sojourned and evaluated a variety of scriptures as it relates to prayer. Uh, we seen prayer for personal reasons that have come about that have changed the individual situation. We've seen intercessory prayers by prophets who have seen, looked out and saw the problems and challenges that their people faced and prayed in regard to those challenges. And we saw that God answered those prayers. We saw the prayer of King Solomon in the book. Second Chronicles, and we realized that his prayer was not as a result of anything happening, but his prayer was in the sense that he wanted to know, to God to know that in the event of, that God would give mercy and show mercy unto his people. Uh, we also uh, had an opportunity to understand without question, without doubt, that God not only hears prayer, but God answers prayer. But what we began to look at and what we ought to begin to see, and I pray the theme we begin to pick up, is that prayer ain't just something we ought to do uh, sometimes. Prayer is something we ought to do all the time. Second thing we got to understand, that prayer is not something we ought to do just as a response to a crisis. But prayer ought to be something we engage in so that crisis will be, will be ready when crisis comes our way. Uh, um, prayer is not the extra. Prayer ought to be what it is that we focus on every day of our life. In other words, we ought not turn to prayer when everything else goes wrong. We ought to turn to prayer so everything else won't go wrong. Let me say it one more time. We ought not just turn to prayer when everything's going wrong. We ought to turn to prayer so that everything won't go wrong. We ought to begin to understand as children of God that our world is changed by our prayers. People are changed by our prayers. Uh, situations, society, all of these things are changed by the prayers of God's people. Let me say it right there. The prayers of God's people. The problem is, and i got a pastor for a few minutes today, that too many people in the church, too many people who are saved, uh, do not look at prayer. It's essential we look at it as extra. We uh, do not understand that prayer is something that we ought to engage in all the time, and that's why the world doesn't understand what the church's role and responsibility is. Uh, last few weeks, we've looked out and heard all types of television reports uh, questioning where is the church, and I, I had to raise my hand and say, where is the church? Because too many times we've allowed uh, popular culture to dictate what we do. But every time a situation comes up, the church ought to already have prayed about it because here's the truth. If we are children of God, we ought to see what's coming before it gets there. I wish I had somebody that saw that right there. If, you're, if we're truly sojourning with God, we ought to see trouble coming. We ought to uh, know, we ought to see the tides turning. And we ought to be praying about it before it comes our way. Here in the book of 1 Kings, we see a man. Uh, that does not is not given. We're not given much in the way of background on him. We don't know his education. We don't know how many siblings he had. We don't know who his mama and daddy were. We don't know if he had a royal heritage. Or he was just a regular dude. But what we do know is this man did not mind calling on the name of the Lord. Uh, we don't know what is his 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 his. his uh, his uh, tax return said. We don't know, uh, again, what neighborhood he lived in and who he used to hang with. But we do know that this man did not mind calling on God and being bold for God. We realize in this 18th and 17th and 18th chapters, is this man Elijah, though he was only given the first name, not even the last name, we do know that he didn't mind calling on the wonderful and powerful name of the Lord. If you go back to chapter 17, and if you would do that for me, we begin to see uh, this, this interesting uh, tidbits. But what I want us to look at is we look at chapter 17, chapter 18 in preparation for our text for today. I want us to begin to realize that there's some elements to having a transformative prayer. There's some elements, there's some pieces that must be put together in order for us to not just be uh, a sometimes prayers, but to be all the time prayers. There's some things that we have to understand that moves us from being regular prayers to be able to pray transforming prayers for our lives and for our world. Look at chapter 17, verse 1. The Bible says, Elijah the Tishbite, and that was of the inhabitants of Gilead. That's the only thing we've given about Elijah. Elijah was a man that was not from the city of Jerusalem. He was not from the suburbs. He was from the country. He was from a rugged place, a place where it was dry and it was hot all the time, and he came out of that area to come and confront the king of, the, of Israel. Look what he says. The Bible says that Elijah the Tishbite was of the inhabitants of Gilead, and he said unto Ahab. In other words, he wasn't working in the king's court. He got up from the country, came into the city to confront Ahab about what was going on. 
And I want somebody to understand if you really want to be a powerful transforming prayer, you got to have boldness in yourself, but not boldness for yourself. You have to have boldness in yourself for the Lord. Let me say one more time. Too many Christians today, we allow and watch stuff happen going back and forth. We don't say a word. We are never moved to confront truth and speak truth to power. Instead, we let folks say what they want to say, and we'll use the excuse. Well, I don't like to talk religion. Well, I came by here to tell some child of God from St. Peter Baptist Church, if you're a Christian, that's not a religion. That is your lifestyle. I got to say it one more time. I don't want anybody to miss that right there. Christianity is not a religion. Buddhism is a religion. Uh, Islam is a religion. Christianity is a lifestyle. In other words, you can put your religion on the shelf, but you can't put your lifestyle on the shelf without putting yourself on the shelf. I'm tired of people in church saying, I'm not going to talk about it. If you know what the word of God says, say it. If you know what the word of God says, do it. Don't stand by and say, well, I'll do what they're doing. And do as in Rome, do it to Roman. No, in Rome, do as you're Roman. But if you are walking around the Christian, do as a Christian. I want to look at this verse one more time. He says he, he went to Ahab, and he didn't just didn't go make an appointment with Ahab. He didn't just go up there and sit down and, and, and have a, a calm conversation with Ahab. He didn't, he didn't get an audience with Ahab to try to, to, to sugarcoat things. He came to Ahab and said, look at Ahab. As surely as the Lord God of Israel lives... Before whom I stand, he said, I'm standing right here uh, uh, representing God to you. He said, it will not rain, not even do going to fall for these next years unless until I say it be so. Who tell when somebody said, why, why did Elijah have to confront Ahab like that? Well, you know what happened? Elijah was watching what was going on. He watched the news. He read newspapers. He realized that not only had Ahab turned from God, but he realized that Ahab had succeeded in turning the people from God. Let me say it one more time. Not only had Ahab turned from God, they had had kings that had turned from God before, but Ahab and his wife had been successful in turning the very people that were known as the children of God from God to idol gods. In other words, Ahab was such a bad influence that Elijah said, I can't sit here uh, and tish, but I can't sit here and tish and allow this to go. It's my responsibility as a child of God to go say something to somebody, and if I'm going to say something, I may as well say it to the king. Let's just say, I may as well say it to the king. Say, I'm not, I'm not satisfied just complaining about it in my neighborhood association. I'm not just satisfied complaining about it to my friends at church. I'm, I'm getting up out of here, and I'm going to tell Ahab, it's enough, it's enough, it's enough. It's time out for playing around. If it, you don't change, it's not going to rain. I wish some of us were more bolder today that we begin to speak truth to power. We begin to tell somebody, it's enough, it's enough, it's enough. This is what thus saith the Lord. This is what God says. This is where God is, and this is what God is going to do if we don't turn around. I'm mighty afraid that the church is watching on the sidelines while the world is going to hell in a handbasket, and we are allowing it because we are afraid to declare, this is what thus saith the Lord. I, I've been convinced more and more as we look out and see folk. Folk want to be saved. People out there prime for salvation. But too many times we're not willing to tell them what it takes to be saved. Well, I know it's going to get quiet. They, don't, they turn the volume on the people back up. I can't get it. Too many times we, we work with folk. We related to folk. We hang with folk. We live next door to folk. And folk are, are, are thirsty for the word of God. And we uh, just decide to talk about something else. We, we, we talk about what was on TV. We talk about Greenleaf. Or we talk about Empire. We talk about everything else. And we don't want to talk about God. We don't want to talk about salvation. We don't want to talk about the fact that Jesus died for our sins. We talk about everything else but God. I believe I told this story one more time, but I'm going to tell this story today. Uh, there was a man who worked at, uh, at Ford Motor Company. He worked uh, there for 25 years. And for 25 years, he worked side by side with this man on this similar line. 25 years, they worked side by side together. 25 years, they took lunch break at the same time. 25 years, they, they went in and clocked in and clocked out at the same clock. 25 years, they hung together uh, after work on Friday. 25 years in and out together. One day, one of the men came in, and on Monday morning, he said, how was your weekend? He said, oh, I had a wonderful weekend. He said, I got saved in church on yesterday. And the co-worker said, that's great. I've been saved for 25 years. And the man looked at him in the face. He said, what kind of friend are you? 
that you worked next to me for 25 years? What kind of friend are you that we had lunch together for 25 years? What kind of friend are you that we hung out for 25 years that you never told me about a, a man named Jesus? Don't you speak to me again. And I believe that some of us are going to have somebody who's going to tell us, look here, you ain't no friend if you ain't willing to tell me about who saved your life. You're not a friend if you're not willing to tell me about the man that died for my sins. Got to have boldness to stand up and declare. The Bible says that after he made this declaration, I can imagine Elijah was ready for some action. But God gave some instructions. And the Bible says, verse 2, in the word of the Lord came unto Elijah and said, Now that you said what you said, I want to take you somewhere else. Get out of Ahab's face now. I want you to go over here by the brook Shereth. I want you to take a, take a break for a minute because I got some work to do. Can I tell somebody, I want to talk about this, about transforming prayer. First thing you got to do is you got to have a heart for God. That makes you bold for God. But the second thing you got to have is you got to be willing to let God send you where he wants you to go. Yeah, can I tell somebody, nobody ever started first grade and then graduated the next year. Everybody had to go first grade to what? Then when you finish second grade, where'd you go? So this moment when you finish sixth grade, you had to go where? To go to middle school. When you finish eighth grade, you had to go where? You had to go to high school. You don't go from first to twelfth grade. There's a process in, in growing. And I want to tell somebody that too many of us uh, want to skip over the process. So we get tired doing the process. But if you really want to have transformation in your life so you can pray a transforming prayer, you got to let God take you through the process. I know Elijah probably wasn't happy that God didn't let him just go after uh, uh, Ahab then. But God said, I need to work on you to get you built up, get you ready, because I got something bigger for you over in the next chapter. Here, here's what I want to break it down to. When you, if you want to have transformed prayer, first of all, you got to know the word. Somebody please lean over to your neighbor and say, you got to know the word. Lean over to your neighbor and say, you got to know the word. You got to know the word. Because you see what the Bible says, it says, and the word of the Lord uh, came unto him. In other words, uh, God spoke directly to him, and God will speak directly to us, but God also will speak to us through his what? Let me say that one more time. God will speak directly to you, but God will speak to you through what? In other words, God is not going to tell you anything outside of what's already in his word. He's going to reveal stuff to you, but it's going to be what's in his word. But if you don't know the word of God, guess what? You can't know what God is trying to tell you. I want somebody to understand this. You can think you can take uh, a vacation from um, Bible study for your whole life, but guess what? You're missing out on God being able to tell you something because you are speaking a different language if you're not where? In his word. Got to know the word. Got to know the word. The word of the Lord came to him. He knew, first of all, he knew it was the Lord. But the second thing is when the Lord told him what to do, he did not start negotiating. He went. Look what the Bible says. Two times it says this, right here in verse 2. And the word of the Lord came to him saying, Get thee hence, turn east from the high thyself by the brook Sherib that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brooks, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Verse 5 says, So he did what? Y'all, the Bibles ain't open. Open your Bibles. Look at verse 5. His, the Bible says, So what? He went. In other words, when God said go, he didn't say why. He's, God said go, he did what? He went. If you slide down a little bit further, same thing happened. In verse 9, verse 8, the Bible says, The word of the Lord came unto him, said, Rise, get up, leave this place, because the, the ravens, the room service is stopped. I want you to go somewhere else. Go down to Zarephath. I want you to go down there. Verse 10 says, So he what? Arose. In other words, in order to have effective power for transforming prayer in your life, you got to know the word, you got to hear the word, but then you got to do what? Abide by the word. Too many of us, again, have become weakened because we are not willing to take God at his word. I want to I talk about that. Let me pass about 30 seconds. One of the frustrating things, and my children in here, so they're going to they're gonna raise their hand about it here is one. One of the frustrating things when you get teenagers, is it when you tell them something to do, they want to ask why? All right, let, me, let me put it another way. When they little babies and you say, go over there, what they do? They just run over there. They always ask you, hey, and daddy, why this and why that? Mama, why this? They, they, they want to learn. But teenagers, for some reason, this is not slap at all the teenagers, but this is, this is just true. When, when, when people get to be teens, they, they think they're kind of smart. You know what I'm talking about. They think they know everything. 
And as a result, when you tell them to do something, then they want to question why. I, I, you know, and the first thing you got to deal with, well, no, I already know that. Well, no, you don't know that because that's not what I was saying. And, and then the second thing they do is they want to know, well, why are you telling me to do that? It's, all, it's always something right there. But, but what I want us to understand is some of us as Christians are the same way with God. God is trying to tell us something. We act like we know something. Guess what? None of us were there at the foundation of the world. None of us said, let there be light. None of us uh, uh, put the moon in the sky and the sun in the sky. None of us scooped out an ocean. None of us breathed into us the breath of life. How can we challenge God? God knows everything. But there we are. God starts to say, say, do something. We start dancing and singing and ham boning and shuffling because we are not comfortable. We don't see how what God is saying is going to do, get us the outcome we want. But what I've learned, if God says it, you ought to do it because he'll make sure the outcome is what he wants. And God's outcome is always better than our outcome. I know that Elijah didn't necessarily want to go to the brook Shereth. When it dried up, I know he said, well, look what happened. God said, no, it's time to get up and go down to Zarephath. He said, why well, I'm going to Zarephath? They're in worse shape than we are up here. But he goes on to Zarephath. When he gets to Zarephath, God had everything lined out for him. You want to have transformative prayer? Guess what? You got to have a transformed life. If you want to have a transformed life, it comes with obedience to the word of God. You cannot have a changed life without knowledge of the word and obedience to the word. You cannot have power in your life if you're not hearing the word of God and obeying the word of God. All you're doing is on the river, and the river is pushing you everywhere. But guess what? If you got the word, you got a paddle. If you got a paddle, you can turn some stuff around. The Bible says it. Skip ahead a little bit after he left Zarephath. He went there, and y'all know what happened. He met with the widow. The widow didn't have nothing. She was gathering a few sticks to make her a cake, her and her son, so that she could die. The Bible says Elijah came down there and said, before you make your cake, make me a cake. And she heard it and did it, and the Bible lets us know that in the days to come, as long as there wasn't rain in all of Israel, they had plenty of meal and plenty of oil. Y'all remember that happened right there, don't you? That, 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 that meal never failed. That, that oil never failed. She was able, her son was able to eat day in and day out, and day in and day out, day in and day out. They were able to eat because of the provision of God. But before Elijah left Zarephath, there was another situation. This is another element of what we got to do to have transport of prayer. The Bible says that this same woman, her son got sick, and his sickness was severe. He was in ICU. Matter of fact, he was near about dead. They were just about to call the undertaker because there was no breath left in him. And she went to Elijah and said, look, Elijah, my son is, is sick unto death, and, 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 and he's dead, and you know he's all I got. She said, he said, verse 19, uh, give me your son. And he picked him up, verse 19. And he took him, and he carried him up until upstairs room and he laid him on in bed and verse 20 tells us something look at verse verse 7 chapter 17 verse 20 look what it says this is some element of transforming prayers he cried unto the lord look what elijah he cried somebody say he cried he cried unto the lord and said lord my god has you brought evil upon this widow with whom i sojourned by slaying her son this we said lord god what's going on lord god what's happening around here. Lord, you, 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 you sent me down here to save this lady, but now your son is dead. Lord, what's going on? I want to take a, take a moment. Some of us feel like we can't go to God and ask questions. But I came by here to tell you it's better to talk to God than talking to somebody else. Some of us want to know what is God doing. Talk to God about it. Don't, 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 don't call your neighbor who ain't saved and say, I don't know what God is doing. How would they help you with a, a God situation? They don't know God themselves. How would they be able to give you insight of what God is doing? The only way you can find out what God is doing is to talk to who? Talk to God. I'm saying, if you, you come call me and all I'm going to do is tell you, let's talk to God. You, you come to the deacons and deacons, all they're going to tell you, guess what? Let's talk to God. Nobody's trying to tell nobody what God is doing because don't nobody know what God is doing but God. See, see, the transforming the prayer means sometimes you got to come to God with some questions, some inquiries, and that's all right. Some of us, we carry stuff in our heart. Guess what? If you're a child of God, don't carry it in your heart. Give it over to the Lord. 
Give it over to the Lord. Somebody tell your neighbor that. Give it over to the Lord. Somebody, somebody sitting up here right now, hold it on to something in your heart. You hold it on to something that ain't yours to hold on to. Give it over to the Lord. You worried about something that ain't yours to worry about. Give it over to the Lord. You, you are all night long tossing and turning. All you got to do is get on your knees and say, Lord, here it is. I'm giving this over to you. Have your way with it. When you give it over to God, God will give you some instruction on what you ought to do. Maybe God will say, wait. Maybe he'll say, pray longer. Maybe God will say, get up and go. But whatever it is, if you want to know what God wants you do go to God. The Bible says that after he finished talking to God, he got up. And y'all know the rest of the story. He laid his body on this boy and three times. And this boy came back to life. And as a result of this boy coming back to life, the same widow woman came to Elijah and said, I know one thing for sure. That you are the man of God and the word of the God, the Lord is in your mouth is truth. In other words, as a result of his calling on God, as a result is his receiving instruction from God, somebody else will be laying to believe that God is God all by himself. And then somebody else begin to know that God's word is what? True. Now, now we're getting our text for today. That was just a little background. A few elements of what it takes to have transformative prayer. Now the Bible lets us know uh, that after a while, verse chapter 18, after a while, uh, that the word of the Lord, again, did what? Came to Elijah. In other words, God spoke to Elijah. Elijah had been where he was for a period of time, but after a while, uh, God said, look here, Elijah, it's time for you to go somewhere else. I've got you ready for a big work. I've, I've worked you. I, I, I kept you. And I, I trained you. I, I, after you left Ahab, I put you over there in the bullpen for a while and let you work out over there at the Brook Shereth. I moved you from there down to Zarephath where you could get a little bit stronger, but now it's time for you to do some strong work. And again, I go back to that point. If you really want to be strong for God, let God take you where God wants to take you. And if you go where God wants you to go, He'll get you ready for the work he has for you. And so the Bible says he told Elijah, he said, come here, and I want you to go now. This time I want you to go and, and tell Ahab something. I want you to go personally down to where Ahab is, and I want you to do something special. I don't want you just to drop by his house this time. I want you to stay there for a little while because I got some work for you to do. I got a special assignment. I can't send nobody else. I'm sending you, Elijah, because it's time for it to rain, but it can't rain until something happens to the people know that I am God all by myself. Go down and show yourself to Ahab. And God said, I will send rain upon the earth. God said, I transform. I change it around. I know that it's a drought in the land, but I take away the drought if you go show yourself. To Ahab. And the Bible says that Elijah went on down to show himself. Verse 2 to Ahab. And, 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 and the Bible lets us know how bad it was. It had not rained in, in, in Israel for, for three years. There had been no rain in Samaria, and he went on down, and, 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 he, and, and when Elijah got down there, he went and found Obadiah, the, 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 the leader, the, 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 uh, the governor of his house, and said, look here, Obadiah, I want you to do something for me. I want you to go and tell Ahab I'm ready to talk to him. And he, Obadiah said, no, nah, don't make me do that. And he's going he to kill me just as sure as I'm standing here if you send me down there. He, he's a hateful man, Elijah. He's a powerful man, Elijah. He's going to kill me just like he killed those priests if you uh, send me to him. Elijah said, don't worry about it. You just go down there and tell Ahab what I said, and God's going to pick you up and put you somewhere and protect you. And I, I don't know if anybody here, has anybody ever seen God pick you up and put you somewhere where couldn't nobody bother you? Has anybody in here been somewhere where God hid you and protected you from the enemy? Has there anybody in here that God had to put you somewhere, but where he put you, you were safer than you were in your mother's arms? He sent him somewhere. He said, let do what I say do and let me handle the rest. Well, the Bible says that Obadiah went. He went on down there and told Ahab. He said, look here. Elijah wants to see you. And sure enough, Elijah and Obadiah had this conversation. But Elijah wasn't scared just like he wasn't scared the first time. He said, look here, Ahab, I tell you what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and get all your prophets of Baal together. I want you to get them all together. Matter of fact, get all of Israel together and meet me up there on Mount Carmel. And I can imagine that uh, Ahab thought he had something going on. He thought he was just dealing with a regular man. But what he didn't realize, he was dealing with a man that was called by God, used by God, prayed all the time to God and obeyed God. I believe he thought he had the upper hand because he had 400 folk who were worshiping Baal. And he said, come on, Israel, let me show you that Baal is the real God. He got down there. Prophet of Baal got in position. Elijah said, look here, y'all go first. 
Y'all go first. Y'all dress your dress your, your, your animal and get him ready for sacrifice and, and build you an altar. And then you call Baal to burn up the offering. No, no fire. Don't get no matches. Don't get no charcoal. Just you call down and see if Baal can send some fire from heaven. See, see if Baal can set this thing on fire by see what Baal can do. And I want somebody to understand. Some of us think that some, we still some idol worshipers now. Some of us think money going to change your situation. Some of us think position going to change your situation. Some of us think power going to change your situation. But power, money, and position have never changed somebody's life. Well, they lined it up. They built an altar. They dressed the bull and put the bull on the altar. And, and from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock, they said, come on, Baal, send down some fire. From 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock, they're looking up toward the sky, waiting on some fire to come down from heaven. Well, about 12 o'clock came and had nothing happening. And Elijah uh, began to feel the movement of the Lord. He said, look here, fellas. Maybe I need to talk a little bit louder because maybe your God is asleep. Because, see, Elijah served a God that does not slumber nor sleep. He said, do what you got to do to get your God's attention. They kept on yelling. And finally, they started cutting themselves. But guess what? Nothing happened. Well, about evening time came. They were soaking wet with yelling out the name of Baal, but nothing had happened. And then Elijah got ready. Over here in chapter 18, verse 36, the Bible says that Elijah said, go ahead and get me an altar ready. He took 12 stones. 12 stones represent the tribe of Israel. He put those stones and off those stones he made him an altar. He said, give me the bull. And he dressed the bull himself, and he put the bull on the altar. He said, get me four big old containers of water. He poured the water. Y'all know what happened. He poured the water on the bull, and so much water was on the bull that it ran down and filled up a trench. It was soaking wet at the altar. But then he stepped back. And I want a child of God to know every now and then you got to step back. When stuff going on and there's a big situation in your life, you ought to step back. When, when, when your troubles are coming your way, you ought to step back. When, when the storm cloud is coming over, you ought to step back. When tears are in your eyes, you ought to step back. But when you step back, don't step out. Step up and talk to the Lord. The Bible says that he called on the name of the Lord. He said, God, God, father of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, God, I want you to move right now. And really, he was saying, don't do it for me, Lord, but I want you to let these folk know that everything I did, I did it for you. He said, I want these, you to move, not so that somebody can say I'm great, but so somebody would know you're great. And if you're a child of God, that's what you ought to want folk to know. You ought to want folk to know that you serve a great God. You serve a mighty God. You serve a powerful God. You serve a loving God. Step back sometime and say, Lord, bring me through this, not for my comfort, but for your glory. He said, hear me, Lord, hear me, Lord, that these people may know that you are God and that these same folk who have turned their hearts from you would turn their hearts back to you. He said, hear me, Lord, that the government may understand that it's not about them, but it's all about you. He hear me, Lord. So that folk won't go chasing somebody who has a negative outlook on everything and, 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 and understand that, God, you are in total control of things by yourself. Hear me, Lord, that, that when people are about to do wrong, they'll do right instead of doing wrong. Hear me, Lord, so that children that are running around killing folk will say, I, I don't need to do that no more. I need salvation. Hear me, Lord, so that women that are walking around with nothing better to do than to find somebody that hope to love them, that they'll come to love the Lord. Hear Hear me, Lord. Hear me, Lord, so that cocaine won't be so significant. Hear me, Lord, so that heroin won't have an impact in our communities. Hear me, Lord, so that folk will stop smoking crystal meth and come into the presence of the Lord. Hear me, Lord, that, that the liquor stores will have to close because folk ain't hanging out front all day. Hear me, Lord. Hear me, Lord. The Bible says that even as Elijah was praying, that God got to moving. One of the things that I believe that happens in the church today, 
is that we think that there's a gap between prayer and God's response. But I want to tell somebody, when you really call on the name of the Lord, God can move right then and right there. I believe this right here. I believe if you ask God for healing, if that's the will of God, healing can come right then and right there. I don't know if anybody ever done this before. If anybody ever been in a situation, you said, Lord, help me, and Lord, move right then. I, I want you to raise your hand. Have you ever been in a situation where you just, all you could do was just call out to God? You didn't have a formal prayer written down. You said, Father, help me, and God move right then and right there. Well, even while Elijah was praying, the Bible says that the fire of God fell. And when the fire of God fell, it consumed the burnt sacrifice. It consumed the wood and it consumed the stones. In other words, everything was burnt up so much that it wasn't nothing but dust left there and the water got evaporated. Well, I want to tell you something. When the water was dried up, when the fire came down from heaven, that all the people saw what God had done. And the Bible says they fell on their faces and they cried out, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And I want us to understand something. When you have transformative prayer, it comes from a transformed life. When you have a transformed life, it comes from obedience to God. It comes from hearing the word of God, and it comes from being willing to pray to God all the time. But when that happens, let me tell you what you will see. You'll begin to see folk around you change. You, you, some of us want to know, well, why folk are still, we talked about this in, Sunday, in Vacation Bible School, why folk around me the same? If you really feel with the spirit of God, if you really praying like God wants you to pray, your, your household should be changed. Your neighborhood should be changed. Your, your, your family members ought to be changed. Folk ought to be changed because you are, are representing God to them. But finally, I'm going to my seat here now. The Bible says that when they came to God, that Elijah turned to the folk and said, get these prophets. Get all these men that have been standing here all day representing a false god. Don't let one of them get away. And take them and take them down to the brook Kidron. And they took them there and they killed all of those prophets because they had misled the people away from God. Now here's what Elijah he said. Elijah, get up. Go have your party because the rain is about to come back. Get up, Ahab. The same one who turned forth from God. I want you to watch what God is about to do. So Ahab got up. He went off to eat the drink. But Elijah didn't go to eat a drink. Verse 42, Elijah went to the top of Mount Carmel. And he cast himself on the ground. Casting himself on the ground, brothers and sisters, meant that he was going to pray and wait on the response of the Lord. Just as surely as God hears our prayers, God will answer our prayers. But sometimes we got to hold on as God develops our blessings. Can I tell somebody this right here? Don't stop praying. Don't, don't stop calling on the name of the Lord. You just hold on because sometimes God is developing your blessings. Sometimes God got your blessing in the oven waiting for your, your blessing to get well. Sometimes God has your blessing right here on the counter because he's ready for, to give it to you, but he want to get you ready to receive what he had. Elijah got up the top of Mount Carmel. He bent down, put his face between his knees, but he had such faith in God while he was praying. He told one of his servants, he said, go down there and see what you see. The man got up and ran down there and came back and said, Elijah, I don't see nothing. Go one more time. He went down there, came back, said, Elijah, I don't see nothing. But Elijah kept on praying, not because he was scared God wasn't going to answer, but he needed some folk to see how God works. Go on down there one more time. And he went on down there one more time and came back and said, Elijah, I still don't see nothing. Four more times that boy went down there, and four more times he came back and told Elijah he didn't see nothing. But Elijah kept on praying. Can I tell somebody, you praying for a job? If you don't get your job, don't stop praying. 
Just know that if it ain't that job, it's the next job. And if it ain't that, the next job, it's the next job. Just keep on praying. Somebody in here is praying for a healing. Don't you give up. Keep on praying because God is able to heal you. Somebody said, I want my kids to get grown and be good. Don't stop praying. Keep on praying. Keep on trusting. Keep on believing. And God will. And finally, that boy came back. When he came back this time, he said, Elijah, I see a little something. I see a little bit of cloud, the size of a man's hand. And he said, look here, I, I, I just see a little cloud. It, it, it may not be much, but I do see one cloud. And, and Elijah said, I know that's the cloud I'm waiting on. He said, run, go tell Ahab to get his chariot ready so he can get back where he's going because the rain is about to come. I'm going to my seat, but I want somebody to understand this right here. When you're a child of God, you got to have some expectation while you have some supplication. Tell your neighbor that. you got to have some expectation while you engage in your supplication so God can give you everything. Somebody's in this place today has doesn't realize that God will. You just got to hold on. Transforming prayer. That's what the church does. Transforming prayer. That's what the people of God should do. Transforming prayer. A prayer that will move from drought to overflow. A prayer that will move us from broken to fixed. A prayer that will move us from beat down to standing up. A prayer that will move us from tears of sorrow to tears of joy. Transforming prayer. Obedience to God. Boldness to God. Knowledge of God's word, nonstop prayer, but finally the willingness and ability to hold on and wait on the Lord. That's what God wants from the church, and that's what he wants from his children. The world can do what the world wants to do, but the people of God have to stand for what God wants us to stand for, and that is nonstop prayer. See, when we are really on fire, cars will come down the street on their way down there to the gas station. But they'll pull in because the fire of God, the power of God will be so overwhelming that folk can't go another block. They turn back around and just come in the streets, not because of who the pastor is or not because who the deacons and leaders are, but because the presence of the Lord will be so strong that will draw them in. And that's where we need to be. Let's give God praise today. Let's give God praise today. God is, God is, God is, and God will. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come this day to say thank you for all that you have done for us, all that you are doing for us. And we thank you, Lord, for your word today that gives us some instruction on how to be engaged in transformative prayer. God, help us to not only pray, but help us to have a thirst and a desire for your word all the time. Help us, Lord, to hear your word and obey your word. Help us to be bold for you. And help us to be willing to wait and watch while you get us ready for your blessings. We say thank you. We pray now, God, for some man or woman in this place today who has been engaged in warfare. But we pray, God, that you give them the strength right now to hold on. And we pray for some man or some woman in this place today who have stood on the outside looking in but now ready for salvation. Move them right now to come and say, I yield, I yield. I can't hold out no longer. Let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us all stand just for a moment today. Hey.